The US Navy just spent $4 billion building a new hovercraft that looks almost the same as the one from 1986, but it shares less than 1% of the same parts. It's faster, it's stronger, it can carry more weight, and by 2035, it might fly without a human pilot. But here's the problem. How do you put a 68-ton tank on a beach you can't even get to? How do you bring Marines to shore when Chinese missiles destroy every ship that gets close? For 40 years, the old LCAC hovercraft did the impossible. It landed Marines on beaches faster and farther than any boat could. But rust, old age, and China's new long-range missiles made it too weak. So the Navy didn't fix it. They built a brand new one. Right now, the first new hovercrafts are joining the fleet. By 2030, all 73 will be ready, and by 2035, they might work without any people inside. This is the story of the hovercraft that won't die. It started with a machine that looked strange and sounded like a jet engine. In 1986, the US Navy introduced the landing craft air cushion, called the LCAC, and it changed amphibious warfare forever. Before the LCAC, Marines could only land on 17% of the world's coastlines. Only sandy beaches with shallow water and no rocks or barriers. But here's what will blow your mind. The LCAC unlocked the other 80%. It could land on reefs, mudflats, ice, debris fields, and even mined shorelines. The LCAC could carry 60 tons of Marines, vehicles, and equipment at over 40 knots. It hovered on a cushion of air so it never touched the water, and it could travel 200 nautical miles from ship to shore, farther than any landing craft in history. For decades, the LCAC was unstoppable. It operated in the Persian Gulf, the Pacific, the Mediterranean, and disaster zones worldwide. But wait, by the 2000s, something went wrong. The Marines kept adding weight, the equipment got heavier, the vehicles got bigger, and the LCAC started breaking down under the load. By the early 2000s, the LCAC fleet was getting old fast. Saltwater ate through the aluminum body like acid, gearboxes failed, propellers cracked, and the Marines kept asking it to carry vehicles it was never built for. But here's the problem. The M1A1 Abrams tank, fully loaded with ammunition, fuel, and armor upgrades, weighed 68 tons. The LCAC's limit was only 60 to 75 tons, and that was already pushing it too hard. The LCAC had four gas turbines, eight gearboxes, and a complex system that needed constant fixing. Corrosion turned the metal panels into holes, and after 20 plus years of service, the fleet was dying faster than it could be repaired. But wait, engineers tried to fix it. They replaced engines, they made the frame stronger, they patched holes, but every fix was only temporary. The LCAC wasn't just getting old, it was obsolete. So in 2010, the Pentagon faced a hard truth. The legendary hovercraft couldn't be saved, it had to be replaced. In 2010, the Navy held a series of secret meetings. The question was simple, can we upgrade the LCAC or do we need a new hovercraft? The answer shocked everyone. Engineers presented weight charts, corrosion reports, and failure data. The conclusion was clear. Upgrading the LCAC would cost billions and still leave the fleet weak. The only option was a total reinvention. But here's the twist. The new hovercraft had to fit in existing well decks. Those are the open bays inside amphibious ships where LCACs launch. That ruled out radical designs. It had to look similar, but everything underneath had to be new. But wait, the Navy didn't want a new hovercraft. They wanted the same hovercraft, just better, stronger, faster, and built to last 30 more years. And in 2012, Textron won the contract to build exactly that, a hovercraft that looked identical to the LCAC, but shared almost nothing with it. The ship-to-shore connector, called the SSC, looks almost identical to the LCAC. Same size, same shape, same mission, but under the skin, it's a completely different machine. But here's what will shock you. Less than 1% of its parts came from the original hovercraft. Fresh turbines, redesigned gearboxes, modern hull materials, advanced controls, everything was rebuilt from scratch. The SSC uses four Rolls-Royce MT-7 gas turbines. The 1986 version had eight gearboxes. This one has only two. The original used mechanical flight controls, this machine uses fly-by-wire. But wait, the hull resists corrosion. 
The propellers are made of reinforced composite, and the payload capacity jumped to 74 tons, enough to carry a fully loaded Abrams tank with fuel, ammo, and spare parts. On paper, it was perfect. But when testing began, everything started breaking. The heart of this machine is its propulsion system. Four Rolls-Royce MT-7 gas turbines borrowed from the V-22 Osprey. Each one produces 7,500 horsepower. But here's what makes them special. These engines weren't just more powerful than the original turbines. They were more reliable, more fuel efficient, and easier to maintain. And they gave this craft something the 1986 version never had. Endurance. The simplified drivetrain uses two gearboxes instead of eight. That cut mechanical failure points by 75%. This beast can carry 74 tons at 35 plus knots in sea state three conditions. That's rougher seas than its predecessor could handle. But wait, the MT-7 engines gave it the range to operate 50 to 100 nautical miles offshore. Those distances became critical when China's missiles started reaching farther than anyone expected. But before it could dominate the Pacific, it had to survive testing. And testing nearly killed the entire program. The first SSC rolled out in February 2020. Engineers were confident. The Navy was ready. And then everything started breaking. Gearboxes failed during stress tests. Composite propellers cracked under load. Electrical systems went haywire. Software glitches caused control failures, and the timeline for operational deployment slipped from 2020 to 2023 to 2025. But here's the nightmare. Each failure forced engineers back to the drawing board. Redesigned gearboxes, reinforced propeller materials, software rewrites, and every delay added millions to the cost. But wait, unlike the A-12 Avenger 2, which was canceled after similar failures, this program survived because the Navy had no choice. Without it, the entire amphibious fleet would collapse. And by 2025, after years of delays, fixes, and setbacks, the first operational craft finally entered service. In 2025, the Navy accepted the first operational ship-to-shore connectors into Assault Craft Unit 4 in Virginia. After 15 years of development and billions in cost overruns, it was finally ready. Marines who trained on the 1986 version stepped aboard and immediately felt the difference. Smoother controls, more power, less vibration, and most importantly, more confidence. But here's the scale. By late 2025, 14 craft had been delivered. The Navy's goal is 73 total, with full operational capability by 2030. By then, every 40-year-old predecessor will be retired. But wait. This machine's real test wasn't in calm training exercises. It was in the Indo-Pacific, where China's expanding missile ranges turned every amphibious mission into a long-distance gamble. Because China didn't just build missiles, they built a wall of fire that pushed US ships farther from shore than ever before. And this craft became the only way through. In the 2010s, China deployed DF-21D and DF-26 anti-ship ballistic missiles with ranges exceeding 1,000 miles. Suddenly, U.S. amphibious ships couldn't operate close to shore anymore. Commanders faced a terrifying choice. Sail within 50 miles of shore and risk getting hit, or stay 50 to 100 miles offshore and lose the ability to land Marines. But here's the breakthrough. This craft solved that problem. Its greater fuel efficiency, higher speeds, and heavy lift endurance allow more sorties per day at longer distances. It can deliver tanks, troops, and supplies from 100 miles offshore. Distances the 1986 version couldn't sustain. But wait, this machine didn't just replace its predecessor. It redefined what amphibious warfare looks like in a contested environment. And it outclasses China's Type 726 hovercraft and Russia's Zuber in real-world utility. But here's what most people miss. Its value isn't just in war. It's in everything else. Disasters, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes places where hovering over debris saves lives. We can hover over reefs, mudflats, ice, hurricane debris, and mined beaches, making it just as valuable in humanitarian crises as in combat. But wait, this machine isn't just a weapon. It's a humanitarian powerhouse. And in a world facing more natural disasters, climate chaos, and infrastructure collapse, that versatility matters more than ever. It can reach flooded cities where roads are underwater. It can land on frozen shores where ships get stuck. It can deliver emergency aid faster than any truck. 
boat, or plane. When chaos strikes, this craft doesn't wait for the water to calm down. It goes anyway. But here's the twist. Its biggest transformation isn't happening now. It's happening in the next decade, when the hovercraft stops needing a human pilot. By 2030 to 2035, this craft is being prepared for semi-autonomous operation. One human pilot aboard the mothership could supervise a swarm of six unmanned craft. But wait, its fly-by-wire controls and software-based brain make autonomy possible. And because it's modular, it can carry containerized missile pods, drone launchers, EW systems, decoys, or sensors. But here's the game changer. This machine could become more than a transport. It could become a combat node, a distributed strike platform that turns every amphibious group into a networked battlefield system. For 40 years, the original craft was untouchable. Then it became obsolete. But instead of abandoning the concept, the Navy rebuilt it from scratch creating a machine that's faster, stronger, smarter, and ready to dominate the next 30 years. From the 1986 LCAC, to the 2025 SSC, to the 2035 Unmanned Swarm, the hovercraft has evolved from a logistics tool into a strategic weapon, proving that adaptation beats abandonment. So how do you land a tank on a beach you can't reach? You build a hovercraft that doesn't just hover, it dominates and maybe the scariest part for America's enemies. This is just the beginning, because this craft isn't the end of the hovercraft story. It's the next chapter. The Navy's $4 billion hovercraft is operational. It's faster than the original, stronger than the original, and smarter than anyone expected. And by 2035, it might not need us at all. You just witnessed the rise, collapse, and resurrection of America's most important amphibious platform. If this story changed how you see military logistics, hit that like button. If you want more deep dives into the weapon systems shaping the future, subscribe and turn on notifications. Drop a comment. Do you think unmanned hovercraft swarms will change naval warfare? And what other boring military systems deserve this kind of breakdown? Let's talk.